uh, special thanks to Susan Sherrod and the Mainwarings and uh, Jerry Simonson for putting on this event. Um, it's just fantastic to see so many old friends and get a chance to rub elbows with the scientific dignitaries that are here, so that's great. Um, real quick before starting, I wanted to give everybody an update on Duardo Cardona. Uh, I called him the day I left uh, for the conference to see how he was doing. He's about halfway through his uh, chemo and radiation treatments for um, uh, lung cancer right now. And uh, the very first words out of his mouth were, say, make sure and say thanks to everybody at the conference for me if you would. So that's what I'm doing and uh, he seems to be doing great. He's very positive. Um, so hopefully he's uh, going to have many more years to finish up his uh, volumes that are in the wings. Uh, just real briefly, um, I first became interested in this subject matter uh, while I was in college. Uh, one of my professors had a complete uh, 10 series of Ponce magazine. And uh, so I read that and got kind of interested in the, um, the uh, spectacle of a maverick scholar taking on establishment science. And so um, I eventually got the Kronos Journal and um, Velikovsky reconsidered. And um, then in 1980, Lynn Rose, who was a longtime uh, speaker at these symposia, um, uh, alerted me to Dave Talbot's book, The Saturn Myth, and um, you know, said that I should track that down. And so I did, and in, I was so impressed by the logical uh, coherence of that argument that I hitchhiked from Princeton, New Jersey to Portland to see Dave to meet him for the first time. And uh, we've essentially been friends ever since. That was 1981. And um, in the early 80s, uh, we published a series of articles together for Kronos magazine uh, on the comet Venus. And um, then in 1988, Dave started the journal Aeon. And so I, I was kind of his right-hand man on that journal for many years. And um, then um, Duardo joined us. And so, you know, we had that together for about 20 years. And so um, basically it's become my life's work. Um, I would say that the, of the many great insights in the Saturn myth, the one that stood out to me was the idea that creation was something that human beings actually experienced and witnessed up close and personal. And so that's kind of the... Um, that's the subject matter of my talk here today. Okay, this is uh, just a picture of what we uh, think the polar configuration looked like at one time during um, a specific phase. The, um, these are, this is actually a simulation done at a top company with a Mars-sized object, a Venus-sized object, and a Saturn-sized object behind it. And um, so that's the image you come up with. And so uh, one of our favorite scholars is a guy named Marcia Iliade, and he's uh, written extensively on myths of creation. And um, so he says, myth narrates a sacred history. It relates an event that took place in primordial time, the fabled time of beginnings. In other words, myth tells how, through the deeds of supernatural beings, a reality came into existence. Myth, then, is always an account of creation. Myth tells only that which really happened. So I'm going to discuss two myths today, uh, one of the oldest known from ancient Mesopotamia, and then one from the New World. Uh, in ancient Mesopotamia, the, one of the oldest rites, uh, you know, recorded about 3000 BC, there's pictures of it, uh, vases showing it, an early text describing it, it's called the Sacred Marriage Rite. And this described uh, a marriage of the, the king, whose name was Demutsi, and the Queen of Heaven, who was the planet Venus, known as Anana. So the, it, the Babylonian paradigm for love and marriage was the relationship between these two figures. 
By the way, every single slide I show today, I'm quoting one of the top scholars in the world, recognized by all the, all the top uh, Mesopotamian ancient Near East scholars. The ritual in question originated in ancient Uruk, where the deified king, Demuzi, familiar from bib uh, biblical passages as Tammuz, married a Nana and thus entered the Sumerian pantheon. The sacred marriage in Ur's third dynasty was celebrated throughout the new year, during the New Year festival when the king, representing Demuzi, united with the, uh, the planet Venus and Anna. Their union was believed to revive the forces of life and fertility in nature and society and to ensure abundance for Sumer in the subsequent year. So basically what this rite involved is the king would enter into a dwelling specially constructed for this situation and make love to this woman who represented the planet Venus. The earliest text we have describing this very well-known um, rite comes from about 2100 BC and it's this King Idindagan's uh, hymn to the goddess Inanna and it describes what he did on his sacred marriage rite. So here's, here's the opening couple of lines. I shall greet her who descends from above. I shall greet the great lady of heaven, Anna. I shall greet the holy torch who fills the heaven, the light. Her who shines like the daylight, the great lady of heaven, the most awesome lady, the respected one who fills heaven and earth with her huge brilliance. Her descending is that of a warrior. Now, I... If you guys go out tonight and look into the western sky, you'll see that Venus is about as bright tonight as it's ever going to be during your lifetime, and Jupiter's right next to it. And so, see if, as bright as it is, if any of you guys would think that, to describe it as it's filling all of heaven, or it's shining as daylight, or it's descending like a warrior. On New, to continue with this same text... On New Year's Day, the day of the ritual, they set up a, be a bed for my lady. They cleanse rushes with sweet-smelling cedar oil. They arrange them for my lady, for there, the queen and king's bed. The king approaches her pure lap proudly. Demuzi lies down beside her. He caresses her pure lap. She makes love with him on the bed. Again, this is a Sumerian text. This is not some scholar, and it's certainly not me. This is the, the Sumerian king himself writing these words. After the union is completed, Inanna rises from the king's lap, and immediately flax rose up with her, the barley rose up with her, the steppe had been filled with abundance like a blossoming garden. And so now this is the top scholar in uh, Sumerian studies today. He says, quite a few sources indicate that through the performance of this rite, ritual great abundance immediately followed. Deified kings who enacted the role of the bridegroom were said to be placed in the holy garden. By analogous symbolism, the divine bride in Anna or Venus was compared to a green garden. The language of the ancient Sumerian texts is so explicitly sexual that it seems beyond question that they describe a sexual union between the king and the queen, or the goddess, the consummation of their marriage. The crucial question, however, is why. Why did this union take place and why was it performed ritually year after year? for thousands of years, by the way. Despite all the various suggestions reviewed above, no scholarly consensus has been reached regarding the basic question. While the importance of the sacred marriage rite for the Sumerians is obvious, it has remained enigmatic to modern scholars. We could use that sentence for virtually the, the next 50 slides I'm going to show. All this stuff remains enigmatic to modern scholars. Despite all the various suggestions reviewed above, no scholarly consensus has been reached regarding the basic question. While the importance of the sacred marriage is obvious and that enigmatic. All right, it didn't go forward. Unfortunately, our sources say next to nothing as to how the Venus aspect of Anana was linked to her functions 
as a goddess of eros, love, and fertility. Because every serious scholar recognizes that Inanna is intimately associated with eros, love, and fertility from 3000 BC on. The belief that the king could in some sense actually have sexual intercourse with the goddess is intimately connected to the belief in the divinity of the kings of this period. So reading the ancient texts, you will find that the, when after the king engages in this rite with the, the planet goddess, that's when his name starts getting a little D besides it, meaning he's now a god himself. Uh, Samuel Kramer, one of the top scholars in uh, Mesopotamian studies, um, discovered a very obscure text that has hardly gotten any attention um, from the other authorities, and it, it describes Inanna um, taking Demutzi up to heaven with, him, with her and placing him as a star alongside her. And so this is how, his conclusion to that text. Since, as is well known, the king of Sumer, as the husband of Anana, was identified with Demutsi, it may be to judge from this ancient text that there was current in Sumer a theological tenet that the king upon his death was turned into a heavenly star situated close to the Venus star, Anana. Oops, went one too far. Okay, this is a guy named Wolfgang Heimpel at the University of California, and this is how he, he wrote the definitive article on uh, Sumerian mythology for the standard encyclopedia in the field. While the fragmentary nature of our knowledge of Mesopotamian culture does not allow us to exclude the existence of astral allegorization among Babylonians, the plots of the myths provide clear evidence that the primary concern of myth was with the great stages of human life and that astral connections and allegorization cannot have shaped the myths in any significant way. A more erroneous view could hardly be imagined. But that's, that's the standard current opinion. And that opinion flies in the face of what is very well known, and that's that in the, again, the most ancient texts we have from 3000 BC, the only gods mentioned are star gods, and so uh, the leading scholar on the earliest writing in the world from Uruk is a gal named Zarzarinska from Czechoslovakia, and here was her comment. In the most archaic period, the determinative dinger, which is actually a star, was associated with astral deities only. So the, the leading gods of the time, like Inanna, they would always have this little star besides their name uh, identifying them as a star. So how do you reconcile that with the previous comment from Wolfgang Heimpel that all these myths describing these figures have nothing to do with stars or planets? So, uh, you know, we've worked in this area for 30-some years now, and you're always trying to come up with an argument showing these guys wrong because they're never going to listen. Uh, no matter how many articles you write, so you want to you come up with an argument that kind of draws attention. And so um, a couple years ago, I stumbled across a myth from the New World here in America, from the Pawnee, um, and they lived around Nebraska on the Great Plains. And uh, towards the end of the 19th century, um, the anthropologist, just as the tribe was basically dwindling down to nothing, the anthropologists started uh, visiting them and recorded their sacred myths, and so that's what, that's what we're going to move to now. So it says, no other primitive people has such an extensive and accurate record of its myths, tales, and legends as the North American Indian. The peoples of ancient, these are, they're talking about the Aztecs now, but it's applicable to the Pawnee as well, as we'll see. The peoples of ancient Mesopotamia keenly observed the sky and used the calendar to predict solar and lunar eclipses, the cycles of the planet Venus, the apparent movements of the constellations and other celestial events. To, to them, these occurrences were not the mechanical movements of innate celestial bodies, but they constituted the activities of the gods. 
the actual recapitulation of mythical events from the time of creation. So in the standard text studying the uh, Pawnee religion by an anthropologist named James Murray, who was actually Pawnee himself, here's what it said. It has been said that they were obsessed with planets and had a sky-oriented theology, perhaps without parallel, in human history. And the Skiddy creation myth, which we're going to come back to again and again, summarized in one sentence by a top scholar, it says, the morning star married the evening star. That's their creation myth. So back to Murray. This is what he said about those two figures. The first one he placed in the heavens was the morning star. He was to be dressed like a warrior and painted all over with red dust. Through him, people were to be created and he would demand of the people a human sacrifice. This was the planet Mars, or the god of war. The second, the second figure involved, the evening star, the second god placed in the heavens, known to the white people as Venus. She was a beautiful woman. Through this star and morning star, all things were created. She is the mother of the skitty, Pawnee, through her, it is possible for people to increase, reproduce, and crops to mature. She's the, the planet Venus is the source of fertility. This is a, another scholar's summary of, this, of the creation myth of the Pawnee. In the creation story, fruitfulness and light had come into the world because Morning Star, the planet Mars, and his realm of light had conquered and mated with evening star, the planet Venus, in her realm of darkness. This is an artist's rendering of the human sacrifices that were still being offered well into the 1800s. I think the last successful one was like 1830, but they, were, they kept trying to do it after that, and there were actually some heroic interventions where, um, you know, some cowboy somewhere would ride up and take the gal off the scaffold, but... Um, this is, a, this is an artist's rendering of what was involved. They would uh, put this, this um, gal, kidnapped usually, up on this scaffold, and they would have the Mars figure come up and shoot an arrow right in her heart, and they would direct the blood down into a pit below the scaffold, and that pit was called the Garden of Venus. So we'll come back to that here in a second. Whoops, I went too far. The sacrifice is said to have been claimed by Morningstar as a reward for his effort in bringing about the conditions for marriage and fertility, except for which the world of the Pawnees would not exist. In many ways, the ceremony amounted to a reenactment of the legend with the sexual penetration of the planet Venus by Mars represented by the arrow being shot into her heart. The sacrifice as a whole must be considered as a ritual dramatization of the overcoming of Evening Star by the Morning Star and their subsequent connection from which sprang all life on Earth. The girl upon the scaffold seems to have been conceived of as a personification or embodiment of the planet Venus surrounded by her powers. When she was overcome, the life of the earth was renewed, ensuring universal fertility and increase. Where have we heard that before? Virtually the exact same sentences from ancient Mesopotamia, involving the exact same planet, the planet Venus. Back to the human sacrifice. The pit below the, where the blood was directed symbolized the garden of the evening star from which all life originates. Again, I'm just citing anthropologists. This has nothing, these are, these are top scholars. This isn't uh, me filling in the details here, writing over them, substituting words. Um, in theory, the Skitty Pawnee ceremonies all have as their object the performance either through drama 
or through ritual of the acts which were performed in the mythological age. The ritual is a formal method of restating the acts of the supernatural beings in early times, in this case, the planet Mars, the planet Venus. So this is back to the original scholar cited, uh, Eliade again, and he's summarizing rituals all around the, the earth, and he goes, every ritual has a divine model and archetype. This fact is well known enough for us to confine ourselves to recalling a few examples. We must do what the gods did in the beginning. Thus the gods did, thus men do. This theory, this Indian adage summarizes all the theory underlying rituals in all countries. To summarize the Skitty Pawnee myth then, I'm just going to throw three different sentences that we've read already together. They're by three different authorities. But the first one, the morning star married the evening star. The second one, all things were created through sexual union between the planet Mars and Venus. And three, with their sexual union, the life of the earth was renewed, bringing universal fertility and increase. Comparing that now to what we learned from Mesopotamia, the first sentence describes the king's union with the goddess Inanna resulted in her granting a favorable promise of fertility and abundance for the land and its inhabitants. Second sentence, Inanna's character is a goddess of fertility who brings about intercourse between the sexes, is also manifested in numerous other sources. Finally, as the Skitty held that all life originated from Venus's sacred garden, so too did the Sumerians deem the planet Venus to be a garden-like matrix and the divine source of all life. And the divine source of all life is in quotes because that was an epithet associated with the planet Venus. Okay, just briefly now, I'll touch on Greek myths, since that might be more familiar to some of you guys. Uh, this is one of my favorite pictures uh, very early on of uh, Aphrodite. So Aphrodite was invoked as follows. Blessed Queen of Heaven, Celestial Venus, who at the time of the first creation coupled the sexes in mutual love. Pindar, Bill Mullen's favorite writer, describes Aphrodite as mother of loves in the sky, Aphrodite. Moving now to a top, a top modern scholar whose book just came out, the artistic evidence makes it abundantly clear that Aphrodite is a synchronon of the wedding ritual. Venus is the star which in poetry enjoys a close association with Aphrodite and with marriage ceremonial. That's James Diggle, another top, top guy in Greek studies. The final sentence there is from Euripides. We sing the heavenly daughter of Zeus, the mother of loves, Aphrodite, who brings nuptials, weddings, to maidens. Walter Burkhart arguably the top Greek scholar in the world today. Admittedly, the connection between Ares and Aphrodite is firmly rooted in cult and myth. Uh, Ares is well known to be the husband of Aphrodite in numerous Greek sources. This, this just came out here in the last couple years. Uh, the top Greek guy at Harvard, Gregory Nagy, put out a book discussing Sappho's poems. Sappho wrote about um, 700 BC, and here's what it says. In the wedding songs of Sappho, the god Ares is the model for the bridegroom, who is explicitly described as equal to Ares. That leads us to the question of who might that bride be? Again, this is, these are Nagy's words. Correspondingly, there are many instances of implicit equations between the generic bride and the goddess Aphrodite. In Sappho's Song 112, for example, the bridegroom is said to be infused with the divine charisma of Aphrodite, evidently by way of his direct contact with the bride. So if you can imagine that, somehow this Aries-like figure is being infused 
with power or glory or something, light call it, from Aphrodite. Where have we heard that before? So in various books I've discussed uh, the, Persian, uh, the Persian goddess of the planet Venus and here's how she's described. She le legitimated the enthronement of the king providing him with his charisma. Again, this is a universal motif. This is found, this is found on everywhere for, for all practical purposes. The planet Venus imbues the king or her lover, her bridegroom with his charisma, his glory, his power. Back to Mesopotamia. The love songs portray Inanna, the life force of the teeming people, passing the divine influx onward to her spouse, the king. We'll go back to the sacred marriage ceremony again. And here's, an, here's a specific quote from, the, from a different marriage ceremony. You, O oh Mistress Anana, you have handed over to him your power as is due to the king, and Demutsi causes a radiant brilliant brilliance to burst out for you. And one of my favorite scholars, a gal named Brushweiler, uh, was talking about this passage, and here's what she said. This passage is interesting due to the way in which, in the context of the sacred marriage, the luminous essence of the goddess is passed over to the king, who is identified for the occasion with Demutsi. Again, it's the exact same thing we just read about with Aphrodite. So all of you that are familiar with Dave's work, we've been talking about this image for 20 years, I suppose, where we imagine Mars being the inner orb there, uh, surrounded by the glory um, uh, of the planet Venus. Uh, the Odyssey we're all familiar with, um, Ares and Aphrodite are caught in uh, making love uh, surreptitiously and they're caught in this net. <clears throat> and so Homer turns it into a, uh, an act of comedy uh, by <clears throat> asking, would you, despite all these ropes holding you tight uh, and embarrassing you in front of the other guys, would you like to lie in bed with Aphrodite? And I think Hermes answers, oh yes, even if there were three times as many fastenings and all the gods and goddesses were watching. And uh, so then the, a commentator called Lucian uh, wrote this, all that he, Homer, hath said of Venus and Mars, his passion is also manifestly composed from no other source than this science, astrology. Indeed, it is the conjuncture of Venus and Mars that creates the poetry of Homer. Not surprisingly, here's the top scholar on Aphrodite's cult. Originally, the goddess Aphrodite had nothing to do with the planet. The link was in all probability made as a result of Babylonian influence in the field of astronomy. Okay, all of us, I'm sure, are familiar with the expression tying the knot. Uh, it's a proverbial expression for uh, w a wedding, and it goes, it goes back thousands of years. Uh, for example, Virgil in the first sentence there talked about uh, Venus tying the knot. This is a very ancient picture of a nana holding a knot. And it's called either the ring or the knot of sovereignty. Sovereignty meaning kingship. Again, back to a top scholar talking about uh, Ishtar mythology. Many astral motifs, in fact, are attested. Ishtar's elevation tells us that the, the god An married her on the urging of the gods and asked her to hold and rule the Tai, Riksu. Uh, tai also means not. Another recent text found. Ishtar, as the planet Venus, described as Kisru. The word Kisru, however, means a knot or a meteor-like object. An ancient text from about 2900 B.C. said, When Inanna had tied the lordship with the kingship for this figure, this Sumerian king, she let him exert kingship in Uruk. A 
again and again and again, and Anna is described as tying on the, the royal headband or the royal crown. Back to the um, sacred marriage rite, again and again and again, and Anna is in this text, there's hundreds of lines of, in this particular text, but on about 10 different occasions, Anana is said to embrace the king, embrace Demutsi. And the word used also means to knot, to tie up. From the same text, May the Lord whom you have chosen in your heart, the king, your beloved husband, enjoy long days in your holy and sweet embrace. Again, this embrace meaning a knot. Give him a propitious and famous reign and give him the righteous headband, headdress, and crown which glorifies his head. I like that quote because it, it almost ties all three things together, her tying on the crown, her tying him with the knot, and her um, giving him kingship. So here's kind of my summary to that. Inanna's embracing or knotting of the king equals his sacred marriage. Inanna's tying or knotting of the royal headband on the king is his investiture with the crown. At the same time, however, her tying on this knot or sexual union with the king turns him into a god. So here's another familiar sign that Dave and I have used hundreds of times. Back to, again, Inanna's knot that symbolized kingship. This is the same sign, or a, an analogous sign, I guess would be the better way to put it, from ancient Egypt where... There it's the goddess that hands the king this shin bond or shin knot, quote, thereby legitimizing his crown and sovereignty. Does that look familiar? And finally, I'd like to just discuss in passing the greening of the world because it's so important to this sacred marriage that's always associated with fertility. Why would they associate the planet Venus with causing fertility everywhere. Here's back to the sacred marriage theme. The holy embrace, fresh fruits and shoots as she rises from the king's embrace. The flax rises up with her. Uh, everything appears like a glorious garden. So here's what we think things looked like. There was actually a greening of the sky associated with this conjunction. That's where this fertility motif comes from and again and again and again you will read that the heavens became greened back to the sacred marriage of the royal bed on where this marriage was performed it was called g-i-r-i-n girin the word itself means blossoming fruitful shining so the king again and again is invoked as long may he live on the flowered throne one of the most ancient symbols of Anana from, again, prehistoric times was the rosette, this figure here, an eight, eight-fold flower-like star. Again, back to one of the top scholars in the world. Another early symbol refers to Anana, the rosette, which somehow was connected with the sign for star. Already in 1922, uh, Daimel proposed their common origin. My own preliminary investigation of this connection is that the rosette is meant to represent the flower, the earthly counterpart of the star. Evidently, he was unaware that this uh, pictograph is found all around the world. This is an example from Ireland. So, to take away from this, uh, this speech in summary, um, I would emphasize that uh, creation was something actually witnessed uh, in prehistoric times. They were extraordinary celestial events involving the planets, witnessed by people all around the globe. Um, the sacred marriage rite uh, commemorated the historical planetary conjunction between prototypical male and female powers. The greening of the world equals a specific phase in the unfolding of the polar configuration. Again, we'll be describing this, I'm sure, for the next 20 years with 
thousands of parallels. It's so obvious, it's unbelievable. No one's ever seen this before, so far as I'm aware. The garden itself associated with the planet Venus was a celestial place, a celestial structure associated with the prototypical sexual act between Mars and Venus. Is it any wonder that flowers to this day are still associated with marriage? Or that rings or bands are still associated with marriage? In our configuration here, the planet Mars has to be in front of Venus. I, I would suggest to you that you can take that to the bank, that Mars was originally stationed in front of the planet Venus. However, if that's true, virtually every modern astronomical textbook will need wholesale revision. Thank you very much. Appreciate it.